Hey folks, Joseph A. Sabora here, and I'm doing a movie review this week, which I just picked this up uh, a few weeks ago as a birthday gift. <laughs> yeah, because I was celebrating my birthday. I wanted to get some more movies, as usual. But yes, I did actually buy a lot of movies from stores like Best Buy, and Walmart, uh, Five Below, and even Big Lots. But I did pick up uh, the original Pet Cemetery, which is based on a novel by Stephen King, who also wrote the screenplay of the film, with director Mary Lambert, who did uh, Siesta. And she also had worked on music videos, too. And then even the Tales from the Crypt episode. So, yeah, this is a a 30th anniversary Blu-ray release. There's also a 4K Ultra HD version of it. And I love the cover art that they chose because it's definitely it's closer to the uh, the cover art from the the paperback or hardback uh, cover that they had from the 1983 novel. So it gives it a good feel to it. But I always remember the original poster where they show uh, Pascal as a corpse but he's also a ghost as well. And where you did see the pet cemetery, and you see a church, the cat, there's a great cat. So this one actually looks really cool. And of course, in the back, which says, Sometimes dead is better. That Judd Crandall said, played by Fred One. Yeah, it's newly remastered. <clears throat> As we speak, yeah, same as usual. Has uh, the cover on the back. It, it says it has um, a new 30th anniversary bonus content, which includes Fear and Rebremnance, which has the cast from the the 2019 remake, which I just saw recently. And frankly, I explained the. Uh, the trailer reaction in February, um, and I, I'm not impressed. And after seeing it, <laughs> I was right, not impressed at all. I wouldn't recommend that documentary at all because it's just a cash in. No respect to the original. But they do talk about how they did it, you know, and everything. But it just feels like you know. What's the point? Then we got a uh, revisitation with new interview with uh, the director, Barry Lambert. It was great to see her, even in her old age, that she's explaining how she got the job. And after doing some editing on the music video of Madonna's uh, like, a prayer, like a Prayer, which aired on MTV before... <laughs> the movie came out. I remember because I had cable at the time when I was living with my family at that old apartment. I was only three years old, almost turning four. <laughs> um, then you got three new behind the scene image galleries joining in where they show the cast and crew which includes uh, actors Dale McCliff Denise Crosby, uh, Fred Gwynn, Miko Hughes, and even Stephen King joining in. He also made some cameo appearance as the minister. All of that. Um, he also got commentaries and old featurettes uh, from back in the day when this was taken from the 2006 uh, DVD release. Or 2007. Um, so that's all you have on this release. It has a digital copy included. So. It's cool. I saw this movie when I was a kid, when it was on TV, like on USA Network. That's probably what I remember watching it on. I think um, I think I might have caught it on HBO as well. Um, but I definitely remember 
enjoying it, even though it was very creepy, scary. I mean, there's scenes that I'll never forget, but there's even some tragic moments in the movie that, that really gets to you. That sort of thing. So, really enjoyed it. They had a sequel, too, which came out in 1992, which had Eric Furlong from Terminator 2 Judgment Day to be in. Which basically sets a standalone sequel, has a different story to tell, plus Stephen King was not involved. So, um, which I would consider to be a criminally underrated sequel, a very decent one. Um, I could definitely see what they were going for as a series, but apparently, I guess, you know, they weren't really expecting much. But I remember uh, that one being as creepy as well. So, well, anyway, let, let's uh, get to the review. It stars Dale McCliff, who later went on to do the TV series Time Tracks, yeah, which lasted two seasons. I remember watching that show. It was really cool. Uh, Quick Win, best known for playing Herman Monster in The Monsters. And he was also on the TV show Car 54, Where Are You? But he's also a Broadway uh, actor himself, appeared in several movies, including uh, films like, um, like My Cousin Vinny, you know, with Joe Pesci and Marissa Tomei, uh, Disorganized Crime with Lou Diamond Phillips, uh, which came out the same year as Pit Cemetery. <laughs> Denise Crosby from Star Trek The Next Generation. She was also in the movie Miracle Mile. She was even in the, the short-lived TV series uh, with uh, Fisher Stevens and Jennifer Tilly called uh, Key West that, that aired on Fox a long time ago. I remember that one. Uh, Miko Hughes, yes, who later went on to do the movie uh, Kindergarten Cop. I believe he also went on to, to appear on the TV show Full House. And yes, as well as uh, Wes Craven's New Nightmare, uh, Apollo 13, and yes, Mercury Rising, which I did not care for. But yeah, that's... Uh, he's a very good actor. Um, uh, Blaze uh, Berda, which I heard they actually use uh, twins to, to play the role of, of Ellie, even though they were going to get twins uh, for, for Gage, but uh, Mary went ahead with Miko because she was so much better. Yeah, it's because of child labor laws that was happening. Brad uh, Guinquist, Michael Lombard, Susan Lombard, Cavi uh, Raz, Mary Louise uh, Wilson, Andrew Habatsek, I'm trying to say these names right, Chuck Courtney, and Stephen King making a cameo appearance. Yep, which he also wrote the screenplay based on his novel, and it's directed by Mary Lambert, which also had producer Richard P. Rubenstein, who worked with um, several movies uh, with George A. Romero, Stephen King, and all that. The movie begins when we meet the Creed family, Louis Rachel, along with their children, Ellie and Gage, all played by Dale McCliff, Denise Crosby, um, Blaze Berdahl, and Miko Hughes as they move from Chicago to Lulo, Maine. After Lewis offers a job as a doctor and at University of Maine, they befriended an elderly neighbor named Judd Crando, who's played by Fred Gwynn, which came by after a Aronico uh, gas truck suddenly passes by. You know, in the road, you know, between the, the two houses. So they're living in the countryside. Um, so 
Judd actually takes them to a pet cemetery, which is spelled uh, with an S instead of a C. So, misspell. That's somewhere in the forest uh, behind Creed's new home. Which, this is where they discover how they bury their pets there when they die. Um, and uh, Judd actually buried uh, a pet there as well especially when he was a kid at a young age and still remembers so basically it explains the the ritual that was happening when when they uh, you know bury their their pets or or even humans as well which actually has an old uh, ancient uh, in the end uh, ritual that was happening well, anyway, on the first day of work, Lewis encounters uh, Victor Pascal, who's played by Brad uh, Guinquist, who was a jogger that suddenly got mortally injured after being hit by a truck. Yes. And that's what damaged uh, his skull. With lots of blood uh, coming out. You can even see the brain that's appearing. Um, it, it was really horrifying. So he actually warns Lewis about the pet cemetery before he dies. Calling Lewis by his name, even though they never met. But that night, Pascal suddenly comes to Lewis as a ghost, um, just when uh, he was asleep, but just woken up and just leads him to the pet cemetery, warns him not to cross the barrier because the ground is beyond sour. Lewis awakens and then he found out that he was all dirty. <laughs> yeah, because he actually walked over there. He thought it was a dream, but it turns out that he really did sleepwalk over there. So he had to take the bed sheets uh, that's already filled with dirt uh, and put in the laundry hamper. Yeah, since his feet was covered with dirt. So during Thanksgiving, um, while the families were away, Ellie's cat Church suddenly got run over, and by the way, her cat uh, was a gray cat. Yeah, that looks almost like uh, my cousin's cat named Rainbow. Yeah. <laughs> I really miss that cat too. Anyway, he got run over on the highway, but definitely realizing that Ellie is going to be totally devastated, Lewis decided to take uh, Judd decided to take Lewis beyond the cemetery that's deep into the woods, which actually has the deadfall and you know, past the cemetery, and suddenly they had to go all the way on top of the mountains and that's where they they found the ancient mimic burial ground which Judd instructs Lewis to actually bury the cat inside but warns him not to tell anyone about that about what they've done but that's when they found out that church suddenly came back to life all reanimated but now he's, he's starting to smell really bad. A lot of blood that happens to, to the cat. And what's even worse, he becomes more evil than ever before. Yeah, that's when he started to attack uh, Lewis you know, by, scratching, by scratching his face you know, with his paw. <sighs> yeah. So Judd explains that as a boy, he himself had tried to revive his beloved pet dog that he buried in the mimic ground. But it might have, which apparently that's what happened because that's when the dog became suddenly evil. But hey, it would probably save Ellie from the grief of losing a pet, though. It just wouldn't be the same. Then we found out that uh, the next door neighbor, a woman, 
suddenly kills herself. Yeah, committed suicide, and that's where we meet uh, the minister, who's played by Stephen King. Yeah, they went to the funeral, and they then they were basically explaining what was going to happen, which leads to all this. But sometime later, which they had a picnic, you know, Gage was flying the kites. And Ellie wanted to fly too. Well, she was drawing pictures and all that. Yeah. But this is where tragedy hits, which is really sad too, and de very horrifying to watch. Was by the time the kite suddenly um, went out of control, because the strain was going out of control, because of the huge wind, all of a sudden. The Aronico uh, gasoline truck, the 18-wheeler big rig, appears on the highway. Judd actually warns um, Lewis to go after uh, Gage because he's going to get run over. And just as soon as the, the truck driver tries to stop the brakes as he spotted the, the kid on the highway, because Gage was a little baby, he got run over and was killed and that's when Lewis actually screams no! 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 just like that but they show pictures of of Gage and the family he has several pictures that they had to look at uh, there's even one that actually had a birthday cake, which actually had Snoopy on it. I'm so surprised to see that featured. Yeah. <laughs> yeah but I know, I know, I, I can't believe I'm laughing, but that was terrifying. And, and I, I remember being shocked when I saw that scene. It really got to me. I mean, I was horrified and, and sad at the same time because Gage didn't deserve this. It happened uh, at the beginning, too. When Gage uh, was walking out, uh, just when they were about to uh, go inside the uh, the house, you know, they moved in. So they were devastated, and Judd anticipated that Lewis is considered burying their son in the mimic ground, hoping that they might find a way to bring him back to life. But Lewis denies it because that's not going to do any good. So they were going to bury him all right um, in a local cemetery. Uh, Rachel's um, family came along, and that's when the, Rachel's father got so upset, got so mad that he had to punch uh, Lewis in the face. You know, they had a huge fight, which actually knocks the, the coffin all the way down. and. Yeah, and they were shocked too. So, that's when Judd suddenly talks uh, to Lewis about the story that happened around, about the Indian ritual ground that was going around, where he tells a story about a local man named Bill Bateman who buried his son Timmy in the Mimic ground, which after he was killed in the War War Two, he becomes a zombie. But terrifying the entire town that later they, they decided to to actually burn the entire house, which I know a man was inside who was ready to be killed by the zombie, and this is the words that he had to say. Sometimes that is better, which he said it three times in the movie. Yeah, because it's evil. So he thought this was not a good idea for having Lewis not to bury over there. But apparently there was no other choice. So 
So then Rachel and Ellie decided to leave at Chicago for a while, you know, just to stay over after making up what was happening at the funeral and everything. But despite the warnings that Pascal and Judd had to deal with, had to tell Lewis about everything, Lewis decided that he's going to go all the way up there by taking his son that, um, that they buried at the cemetery, just decided to take a shovel, dig it up, you know, grab the coffin, take the son out, and take him all the way to the mimic ground so he could be revived, hoping this will work. And that's when the worst thing starts to happen, when Pascal suddenly warns um, Ellie in her sleep that he was telling her that something terrible is going to happen. And he was also going to warn Rachel about it. Which also led to a story uh, for Rachel, too, because she explains about um, her sister Zelda, who had spinal menatitis. Yeah, I mean, that's what made her so creepy looking. But you felt bad for her because she was suffering from that. Which, by the way, was, was played by a guy um, named uh, Andrew Hopasek. Hop so, yeah, he played the Zelda. And apparently, Rachel uh, was, was being haunted by it because we, she never knew if, if she was dead or not. That's what's scary about it. So she had to explain that to Lewis at the time. Well, anyway, by the time um, Gage was revived, it turns out that it that he isn't exactly what he used to be, of course, because now he became evil. That's when you started hearing all these uh, baby laughs some weird baby laughs. He goes around taking a scalpel from um, Lewis and starts to go after uh, Judd. Yeah, this is where he actually slashes uh, his heel and then later slashes his mouth and was killed. Church suddenly appears and was ready to attack uh, Lewis yeah, you can even tell how creepy Church was becoming. Yeah, with all that glowing eyes. Glowing green eyes. So he decided to eject Church with morphine. And that's when Church died. And then he decided to go after um, Gage as well. Because, of course, Gage was the one that gave a phone call. After um, he killed uh, Rachel. Just when, when Gage was uh, dressed up, uh, just like in the poster, as a uh, bit of a dancer. Um, yeah, so Gage actually used a scalpel to stab uh, Rachel, but also hangs her through the attic, and that's when the. That's when Lewis was ready to go after uh, Gage by injecting him with uh, the morphine. But Gage was attacking him really hard. You know, started biting him and you know, ripping the, the shirt and his body and everything, all, even his neck, all that. Because Gage also ripped uh, Judge's neck too. <laughs> so then. Lewis decided to inject him, and you can basically hear um, the crying coming from Gage, and then this is where he says at the end, No fair! No fair! Then he dies. And that's when Lewis, that's when Lewis decided to take uh, Rachel out of there, and decided to burn the entire house of Judd's, all the way down, since they're dead now. It burned. It already burned uh, Gage, already burned Church and and Judd as well. So now he decided to take um, Rachel all the way up to the mimic ground, hoping to revive her. 
but Pascal just warns um, warns him that uh, that's not going to happen. I mean, it's going to get much worse, just like what happened to Gage and Church. So he he did it over there. He had to wait for like maybe a few days. He was playing the solitaire. That's when he finally found out that Rachel just came by. Yes, he says, darling. And yeah, this is where it had that creepy, that creepy ending. Not the best ending that they ever got. Was when Lewis falls in love with Rachel that's already a corpse and you know, all that juice was coming out of her eye her eye was missing and then she suddenly takes the knife and starts to stab him and Lewis suddenly screams and that's where you hear the theme song by the Ramones yeah pit cemetery I don't want to be buried in a pit cemetery I don't want to live my life again. <laughs> yeah. Now, in my opinion, I thought this was one of the best Stephen King adaptations I've ever seen. For its time, you know. 30 years ago, it was definitely one of the biggest hits at the box office. When it came out on April 21st, 1989, um, out of its 11... Point five million dollars. It made fifty-seven point five million. So that was a huge hit. So it would have been a lot bigger than ever before. Even worth home video releases too. Also, the direction by Mary Lambert. She did a wonderful job uh, directing this movie because, after all, she did love all the novels from Stephen King. She became a fan, even though she wasn't considered to be a horror director you know, after directing Siesta because that was a suspense thriller she wanted to do something different but I guess she didn't expect it to actually do a, a Stephen King adaptation so and she wanted to do justice too which is very surprising so she, she wanted to uh, keep the source material just right coming from Stephen King's script so even Stephen King uh, admired her. Happy to see that. I mean, yeah, the movie did have its issues. Like, for example, why can't the highway have a lot of um, you know, sidewalks, you know, so that way it can avoid danger here? And why, and why couldn't they put any road signs to know that a pedestrian is about to walk past? Or even a uh, an animal walking past by the roads and why can the truck driver just pay attention to the road while well, you know something's going to go right behind? You know, like, there might be a car uh, passing by or whatever, but I know. I, I wish uh, they had done something like that, but that's actually how it was in the story. So, in Maine, everything's possible. Because <laughs> that's what Stephen King was from. <laughs> Plus, you got a solid cast, no doubt about it. They were all good. Well, except for Blaze uh, Berdahl, because, I mean, her acting was uh, pretty peculiar and, and just, I hate to say this, it was pretty bad, because the way she screeches out when she cries, I mean, it's like I, I can't even understand the words she was saying when she was actually explaining about you know, Pascal, you know, warning her, or, or the fact that he was afraid that her cat's going to die. She doesn't want that. That sort of thing. But, of course, played by twins. They had to go for that. Um, but Miko Hughes, on the other hand, was very good. I mean, he doesn't speak much, but he was very cute. He was only, like, like two years old when he played the role. Um, it was a blonde and it just it's just sad to have him to see him end in a tragedy, you know, during that horrifying uh, accident. Uh, like he didn't want to see uh, Gage die that way. 
Uh, Dale McCliff and Denise Crosby definitely work together with, with chemistry. Uh, Frank Wynn definitely uh, his solid performance. I mean, this is a lot different from you know his Herman Monster uh, character on the Monsters. Um, but I really, uh, but I really love him too. And it's just sad that he's no longer with us. He died in 1993, but he'll always be remembered. Nevertheless, uh, I love um, Brad uh, Gwynquist's performance as Victor Pascal. Yes, he does become as humorous as ever, even when he's a ghost. But he's basically an angel, but he's supposed to be the kind of guy who can actually scare everyone. But I, I, I like the the idea where you get a character who's, who's now a corpse and who's a ghost and you basically see how how scary looking he is but he's been, he's basically an angel and not a monster so I love that but what really did creep me out was Zelda yeah which you do feel bad for her because you know, she had spinal metatitis that was affecting her body you, know, you can see skin and bones all the way even on her face too, and her whole body, it was, yeah, it was grotesque, but that was very frightening. But I love how it centers the story behind that, because now we know why Rachel was afraid. And just as everyone else was. But. Plus it was very creepy, very scary, um, the way I saw it. It was very intense. The movie was actually shot on a beautiful cinematography that was done by Peter Stein and a lot of great editing by Daniel P. Haney and Mike Hill. So, now, I know the movie was a lot different from the novel that Stephen King wrote, and he wrote the screenplay, so he had to do some few changes here and there to see the difference, like, like, we found out about uh, Judge's wife, Norma. In the book, uh, she had a heart attack, but apparently, I, th I think uh, she was alive. And then there was a different ending to it that didn't end like like what happened when uh, Rachel you know, came back to life, already looking like a corpse, like that messed up her eye, and then she's ready to take the knife just when... When Lewis was about to kiss her, all that eye juice was coming out. It was disgusting. <clears throat> I mean, I know, I know. They wanted to do that just to go for scares. But whatever. I know people say the the song Pet Cemetery was out of place, but I don't know. I mean, I could definitely see maybe somewhat of an eerie uh, theme that they would have played before they played the song, but. They had to edit it that way. Yeah. Uh, I remember how creepy uh, Church turned out to be just when he got uh, revived and came back to life. And I noticed how uh, his eyes were glowing. Yeah, completely. I mean, that's how creepy it is. And I, I love that one scene where <laughs> Lewis. Uh, as he saw Church, you know, laying down with uh, Rachel, and this is where he says, "Fuck off, hairball!" And Church was ready to attack uh, Lewis, but misses. So, um, and I think it's also one of the rarest uh, Stephen King adaptations where it's shot in Maine, and it might be the first one to be shot there. I think could be wrong, but. That's what I miss nowadays. I mean, the movie had practical effects, too. Not a CGI in sight, I, although there was one scene where it did have a special effect that was part of Lewis' imagination, where a head suddenly pops out, like, like if it's in 3D form, just when he was about to go all the way up on top of the Mimbeck ground. Also, the Mimbeck ground was actually uh, set... Uh, 
beautifully too. I mean, the way they shot that in the mountains. Uh, I, I thought, wow, this, this is like beautiful cinematography that I ever saw. And all, and the, how beautiful the scenery looks, everything. And the way they, they set the, the mimic ground, um, that's starting to look almost like uh, like one of those horoscopes or something like that. That's, that's what I thought. It's, it's really, really interesting. Um, and yeah, the score was done by uh, Elliot uh, Goldenfall, which, uh, of course, you got two songs uh, by Ramones. I already mentioned the title song. They even got Sheena is a Puck Rocker, which the song was actually played while the truck driver was was running around, you know, before tragedy hits. Um, yeah. But the... Uh, but Elliot uh, Goldfall actually created an eerie score that you will never forget. I mean, it gives it that feel to it that makes it more scarier. So, and you don't need uh, too many jump scares just to go for that. The creepiness and the scariness, everything. You don't need that. That that's what's impressing because we know. That's, uh, that's really impressive, because that's exactly what we need. So. Anyway, um, I put this on my best list of 1989, as I really enjoyed it. I loved it. So, I understand there are people who don't like this movie. People may think it's mean-spirited and everything. That was the whole point. Or I, they kind of wish the movie could have been better, but story-wise. I mean, they even say the book is better. But, either way, I love the movie. I mean, the book is as scary as it could be, too. And and I, I understand. But, I really did enjoy the movie, and I loved it. So, And I'd rather stick to that over the remake. Hell, I'd rather watch the sequel over the remake any day. But, you get the idea. So, so that's Pit Cemetery. Because sometimes dead is better. And I give it four stars. I'm Justin Vesabora, and I'll see you later. Bye.